Great. And so our next speaker is Dr. Andrew Kosser with how we limit urban tree species diversity and how we get that to change, how we can change that. Hey everyone, thank you for having me today. Thanks. It's great to see everyone in person again, which is really nice. Um, and today we'll be talking about some work that I did with my PhD student, or past PhD student, now current colleague, Deborah Hilbert, um, just a rock star who um, I loved working with the last four years and we've continued to interact daily on, on this issue and other things. So <clears throat> this is a picture of the St. Pete kind of beachfront showing all the trees in the canopy. Looks pretty diverse. You got a mix of palms and, and you know, broadleaf trees and maybe even some conifers in there. <clears throat> so, you know, but looks can be deceiving when we look at some of the data and we'll talk about that today. Um, when I first started looking at diversity, I really wanted to get the question of how many tree species are there? And it took until 2022 or this year for someone to really pin a good number on that. <clears throat> this is one of those papers where the authors go 40% down the page. Um, just a bunch of taxonomists from around the world looking at um, what is known, what is categorized and is a distinct, um, you know, print or press pressing of a tree leaf and all of its, you know, morphology. And then what is, what do they estimate is left undiscovered at this point? And they came up with 73,000 tree species worldwide. In North America, uh, things are a little less diverse. Um, you know, South America takes the prize for diversity, but we're looking about 8,646 species that are in some sort of um, documented resource, some sort of um, uh, herbarium of some sort. And they estimate 11,000 species exist in our continent, leaving uh, 2,500 yet to be found, mostly in Central America and you know Mexico and things like that, um, which is pretty cool. You know that that is areas for discovery yet. There's a lot of diversity out there, um, and it's this is quite different from the numbers I see when I look at inventory inventory data from cities, right? And this diversity is important. You know, we know diversity is important for wildlife habitat and for feeding of insects and the things that feed on insects and, and all sorts of critters. Um, and, and now they're even looking at the human and health benefits of uh, urban tree diversity. You know, some mixed results at this point, um, the scientific reports from Nature was looking at and had present use and how street tree diversity affected it. And it was more of the coverage itself rather than the diversity in this case. But there's a, there are starting to mass data sets where more things are becoming um, significant, um, you know, in response to diversity in the urban area. You know, how does that compare to urban forest diversity? That, that you know, the 7,000 or the 11,000 trees in North America, how does that compare? Well, I'll start with some data from some of the cities that I work with, some of the areas I work with. Uh, in Tampa, every five years we do a, a urban forestry assessment using the iTree ecosystem uh, uh, assessment protocol, um, going through 200 plots in the city. And in doing that, we found 112 unique species. <clears throat> this is what we would call richness in an ecological um, terminology. This diversity is far greatest in residential landscapes because you have people that love weird plants. They go into plant swaps to bring stuff in and that's where the bulk of this is coming from. When you get to more institutional or resident uh, commercial properties, you set, tend to see a more streamlined palette when professionals are getting involved, right? Um, but most of those 112 species occur maybe just once or rarely, right? The vast majority of the trees are a common cadre of species that you probably all know and love, right? Um, when I came down here from Wisconsin, my dendrology was useless. Bald cypress and red maple were the only two species that came down with me for Illinois. I stopped on the way down. Um, but my dendrology was Wisconsin training. And I thought I was in trouble. Well, you only need to know like 10 species to inventory a given city. And that was uh, quite, quite a, a savings in the learning curve. <clears throat> so of those 112 species, the most the heavy hitters here can be put down to four species, right? 
Live oak, laurel oak, cabbage palm, and cypresses account for 48% of the canopy in the Tampa area, those four species. Two of those are in the same genera, right? Yeah. And what do insect pests love? Things from the same genera a lot often, a lot of the, the really intensive things, right? You could lose half that canopy just with one thing that really hits on oaks, maybe like oak wilt or something if that existed um, <clears throat> in the state. Here's another um, project we worked on. This is Hillsborough County Park System. We looked at 144 parks, 11,000, uh, nearly 11,000 trees. And live oak makes up 38% of their canopy, or their trees by stem count, actually, not canopy in this case. Um, and then <clears throat> sand live oak, laurel oak are also heavy hitters in this group. So nearly 60% of their canopy, or their stem count, sorry, in this case, is tied to one genera. So um, th these are this is kind of scary, you know. If you if you think about what happened in other places, and I'll show you some of that in a little bit. Um, but you know that's a very localized view of things, right? That's just one county and one city. Well, what happens when you look beyond that? Well, uh, a friend of mine, Richard Hower, had this data set where he asked people a simple question. He's like. What are your top six or top six species? Because it's something that was asked in past surveys. And what percentage of your canopy or your urban forest do each of these make up? And he did this through all the major cities in North America. You know, everything over like a hundred thousand. He pretty much got most of the cities and then sampled below that. <clears throat> and he found that in the in the US, the average US city, regardless of region, if you're thinking southwest, northeast, northwest. They rely on six species for 61.5% of their canopy, right? So that, I mean, if you think about like the 10, 20, 30 rule that Santa Moore put out from the Arboretum, uh, the National Arboretum, that's kind of in line, but it's kind of deceiving because usually the number one is like 20%, you know, and everything else kind of trickles down. Um, and that's kind of seen in the next bullet point, which is in the Midwest and the Northeast, one genera Will rep the top genera in each of those regions represents either 27.5 or 32.9% of their trees, right? Uh, Northeast being really reliant on things in the, you know, the maples, the Acer genera. So, um, and these are the risks of this. This is, this is a boulevard in Toledo, Ohio. This is um, courtesy of Dan Herms from now Davy Trees, showing uh, this boulevard that was probably a one-time elm, replanted with ash, another riparian species that's a, a bulletproof tree that you can just plop in anywhere, and it's gonna take off. And you go from a tree-line canopy to nothing in a couple of months, right? A couple of years. And folks, really smart, smart folks at the Forest Service have used these kind of scenarios to track the health impact of that instant loss of canopy. We have can counties where there were trees that were, you know, they had like 60% of their canopy lost versus 20. And they could figure out there's, there's actual increases in heart and lung risk in the counties where they lost a lot of these trees due to emerald ash borer. Uh, and we've had this here, right? So this is, this is laurel wilt. If you have an avocado tree, you may have heard of this. It, Back to Red Bay. And, you know, Jason Smith, our, our main forest pathologist here, calls it, causes, calls it the worst thing to happen to the trees in Florida, but it's, it's a swamp species. It's kind of a secondary species. So no one really talks about it like we would if it was a tree line your streets, you know? Uh, something that is more visible, especially along our highways, is lethal bronzing, right? Um, attacking at first things in the Phoenix genera. We thought the Phoenix trees were kind of the it's special pet, but now we're realizing that um, this phytoplasma is attacking a lot of other things, right? So to see what this looks like, this, this is going back in time with Google Street View. Uh, this is a highway close to where I live. I'm not gonna say what FDU department manages it, but you know, within months of planting, uh, you can see the effects of lethal bronzing on this planting. Uh, going six more months, this is what's left. But three years later, uh, it's all back with a different species. 
that was probably selected because it wasn't on the list of things attacked by lethal bronzing at the time, but by the time it was in the ground, it Bader had found that it's been attacking uh, Mexican fan palm too, right? So, you know, the, we, history repeats itself over and over again. And this is the picture of insanity, not the definition, this is the picture, right? <laughs> but why do we limit diversity in our urban areas? And there's a lot of reasons for this. I mean, if you think of all of genetic diversity as being captured in a funnel, you have biological limitations. You know, just different species are hard to propagate and germinate in the nursery. They just won't do when you're, you know, all 11,000 trees in North America will not make it in Florida, right? Um, they raided the Providence, discovery loss. Um, and then, you know, so we have just the biological stuff filtering things off the start. What can we get here in Florida? And then what can people produce, but not just produce to get it to grow, but grow in a manner that people want, right? And they get things that grow straight and fast and are consistent in their look because we want it all the same. Um, can we meet the customer demand? It's got a flower like this, it's got to do that. And, and so we're filtering things out further and further. And then we have astute landscapers and urban foresters who are like, well, we're in the urban jungle here. There's a lot of shade, we need shade tolerant species. Or the soils here are higher in pH, we need something that can tolerate that. And they're looking at the site itself and what is offered in the urban area, and they are further limiting what they're putting in the um, in the landscape. Or maybe they have experience and just like this thing makes it, and I don't want to look like an idiot, so we're going to plant this again and again, right? And then beyond that, they're the, the personal traits. Um, I was in a neighborhood, in, actually Ryan was in a neighborhood in Tampa where it was starting to flood because their their uh, drainage was going out and they want to put things that would tolerate it, like bald cypress in. And they're like, no, no, no. We don't put bald cypress in this neighborhood. This is an oak neighborhood, you know, because it's kind of higher class. So um, <laughs> they didn't want those trash swamp trees in their neighborhood, right? <clears throat> so there are all these things that keep filtering out the possible possibilities and how can we get past that? And then you think about the feedback loops in our industries. Now, you know, there's diversity in the folks that handle trees. The growers want to grow something that they know is going to sell in three to seven years. How, you know, how many other industries have to look that far out? And the longer it's on their property, not being sold, the more chance something can wipe it out or something can go wrong, or it can go out of favor with the landscaper. So they want to get it out as soon as possible. They want to rely on things that have been proven performers and sellers in the past. The designers, they can make the, all the designs they want, but if they can't find the materials, it doesn't matter. So they, they're specking the things that are in the nursery. The nurseries are producing the things that have sold in the past. There's this feedback loop growing. The landscapers, they may see that design. And they're like, well, I'm on the hook for this. I think I'll just make a little substitution here for something that I know will make it. And you have further meddling with this, right? And then the urban foresters, they know they're on the hook for the next... 40 to 50 years, maybe 80, maybe 100 years. And so they're thinking the long haul and they, they want the things that are big there now and they know we'll make it. And, and so there's all, and this is this feedback loop. People can't buy what's not available, but the growers know that they can sell what's already being sold. And it just, it's hard to break through that cycle. I'm, I'm struggling with explaining that, but yes. So in short, we have what we would call a wicked problem, right? where you have complexity, uncertainty, and people with different values interacting to create something that's problematic and has been played out with emerald ash borer, with Dutch elm disease, with Asian longhorn beetle, bay wolf, all these things, Texas, or Phoenix or lethal bronzing, all of that. So we're trying to get past that. Um, we, we started in Florida. Uh, and this is research that was funded through Clue. Thank you, Clue, for this. Uh, this is Deb Hilbert's dissertation work. And her last year was just doing a deep dive in this because she had been like a, a tech for me, you know, doing work on the side for a long time. Um, and we wanted to look at focus groups because we want to get all these people together in the same virtual room, Zoom, the designers, the, the urban foresters, the growers, right? And explore the connections that they had and the 
the weak, the you know, the bottlenecks in the supply chain and where things are going wrong to see if they could come up with some solutions as a group. And we looked at specifically at barriers and opportunities within this group with regard to increasing the diversity of our trees. We broke it kind of nominally into North, Central, and South. I think this is a master gardener image. Um, it works because the trees differ. You know, you have that tension zone in the center part of the state, you have tropicals in the South, and you have more temperate species to the North. And production systems differ a lot. There's a lot more bald and burlap up in the North for nursery production. These are our focus groups. We had two growers, one field grower, one container grower, two municipal people, arborists or urban foresters, and then two landscape architects either working on their own firms or um, for a city or government of some sort. And we did that three times. The goal is to keep doing these until you start getting saturation in your responses and getting the same kind of information. And we did manage to get a lot of that within the three focus groups. Um, the sessions were 90 minutes. They were conducted via Zoom, which is a treat because Zoom has really good transcript kind of software. And with minor cleanup, you've got your whole transcript right there rather than doing it yourself with a computer. So that was, that was, a, that was beautiful. We were suited for 18. We got 19 people because someone was really excited and invited someone. And we just <laughs> like, whatever, you know, it's more the merrier. Uh, ranging from experiences from four to 40 years. And then we use Quirko, so a lot of people use NVivo. This thing's one of those programs that does the same job for like, you know, hundred bucks for a perpetual license. So it's kind of nice for that regard. Um, <clears throat> you can see here, you can't read this all, especially in the back, I know that. The general tech, uh, whoa, that was cool. So, so you have production, the production things that are limiting diversity. We have the purchasing things that are limiting diversity. As you can see, the purchasers are a lot more picky, right? They're all the things that can limit their decision to buy a certain species are getting piled on right here, you know? Uh, where the, the growers, they're, they're worried about demand and sales, right? They lost, we lost half our growers in the Great Recession. And the ones that made it, made it by not making any mistakes, by convincing banks they could keep going on, and by um, selling what was tried and true, right? So there's a, there's a hesitancy to like go beyond that for a lot of folks. Uh, and then the, you know, the people that are buying, they have all that laundry list of everything we think about when we talk about site and species selection in our master gardener guides and in our, our certification guides and stuff like Florida Friendly, all that stuff's in their mind, you know? Whereas growers, they control a lot of that with their, their growing environment, especially if you're in a container growing environment, right? Uh, one thing that popped up, come on, do it. Oh, regulations. This came up in both groups uh, in a big way. Um, and that's something that we're gonna focus on for the rest of the talk, so. Uh, the, the producers, they were worried about their budgets and their costs. They talked about the Amazonification of purchasing. Everyone wants a tree, that tree that they want within two days for free shipping right now. now um, but it doesn't happen. It takes years to grow a tree, right? Talk about demands and sales, the growth rate of trees. Guess which trees? So if you know that you can grow a tree and it takes, okay, so you're selling trees on size, right? And it, you sell the tree in it's two inch size and one species, which is the rat of the tree world, you can get to two inches in five years. And the underutilized species, if you get that two inches, takes eight years. And you get only so many cycles on your land before you retire and die, which one are you gonna sell? The one that gets there faster, right? So growth rate is incredibly important. And if we don't support, the, the effort it takes to grow longer trees, we're not going to, underutilized trees, we're not going to get that. Um, regulations, risks, uniformity, issues like that. If they can't grow a straight tree that looks good, it doesn't matter how novel that species is. Uh, yeah. Purchasers are looking for availability. They want cost. So they want that cheap tree, even though they want diversity. And that, you know, so um, they, want, they want it now. They want what has worked in the past in their city. They, they, sometimes they, they want what the mayor wants, right? And sometimes the mayor wants palms along the Bay Shore, and you're just like, okay, that's what we're getting, you know. Um, so there's politics involved. 
and then risk, uniformity, site, all of that. Um, availability. People talked about the need for collaboration. Some people like, this is the first time I've talked to people outside of my field, you know, in this focus group sitting. And this is, they're like, this is great. Uh, education, experimentation, that's, that makes everyone in this room happy, right? Um, changing regulations, contract growing, collaboration, things like that. How much time do I have? Five minutes. I'm going to go quicker then. So, what can we do about this? So, we came home with like seven take home points from the focus group. And, and you know, we look at all the data, that's exciting. Uh, it justifies things. But what can we do with those interviews? What can we do that's actionable that we can actually do in the short term? Well, we talk about communications. Right now, our communications between growers and purchasers are about, are kind of one way, right? We have, Great things like plant ants and um, bet trucks, these plant finders, they will let you actually look at the exact, some people will put the exact image of the tree that you're gonna purchase on these sites, which is really cool. But the communication is one way, it's from the grower to the purchaser. What if we took away some of that and we had a way to communicate back from the purchaser to the grower? Think about like, this is a Kickstarter, right? What if you could say, I want 100 units of this species and I can't find it anywhere. And maybe someone's like, well, for 300 units, I'd start producing it on my property, right? So all of a sudden someone, you know, like you almost could like say, okay, I'll grow this and then cities could buy in and there could be template contract growing kind of language in there that sets you up to buy the species and kind of takes the friction of that communication between the two groups. Because right now, the only way this is gonna happen if someone picks up a phone and calls someone and no one likes to do that anymore. So maybe we can have some sort of interface where, no, I mean, I'm serious, you know, removing friction to facilitate these conversations. I'm engaging in contract growing. The next step is saying, sharing that risk, right? There was a risk with trying something untried before. That's what experiment, we're, we're comfortable with experimenting, right? But a grower who's gonna make a living is less. So if they can share the risk with the city or the developer, and say, we'll do our best, but we're, we need some money up front and we need some assurances that you'll be lenient with what comes out of it, knowing that this is untested. People have worked this out. New York has worked this out already. Uh, this is an example in Detroit where they were actually upsizing stuff on and contract growing things on, on, on like on vacant lots in the city and letting residents do it for extra money when things went south with the economy. There are ways to do this. Uh, avoid approved species list. Our cities love these lists, right? These are the these are the trees that we want. But as I said before, if you've got like thirty species, the grower has told us they'll look at this list and what's the fastest growing two or three things on this list, right? And that's what they're growing, right? So maybe switch to a do not plant list. Uh, we have thirty percent of our canopy is this species. You can't plant it anymore. And then the growers will see that and like, oh, well, I got to adjust. I'm not planting more. I'm not, I'm not doing any more live oak sales in the city, you know? Uh, be less rigid with your planting stock requirements. If you're trying something new and untested and non-cultivared, it may be harder to get the Florida Fancy, right? Um, Florida Fancy is a grade, kind of like a fruit grade that we have for trees. Um, and, and a lot of people like to use that. It says like, you know, this, not only do you have to be on this list, but they want, this city wants to be Florida grade number one, right? Um, and Florida grade number one, that's not too bad, but is what I've learned from like Ed Gilman and others is like, it just takes a snip to take this one right here. You snip that one branch off, that one codominant, you've, you've just raised that tree a grade with one clip, right? So what the grades are really telling you, unless there's like root problems, is you might have to do a little bit more work in the landscape to get it the way you want, right? So be a little bit more lenient is the take on. Um, specify based on age and not stock size. We specify things based on the container size or the caliper, but there's a whole realm of tree production in the forestry sector that specifies based on the age of the plant, right? This seed, yeah, there we go, finally. This seedling right here, is a 2-0. It was in a bed for two years. And it's this big about. Take her, it goes up and down. This is a 3-0 seedling that's been in the bed for three years. 
And this one has been in one bed for two years and another bed after being undercut for two more years. So it's a four-year-old seedling, which is time is the true cost of production for growers, right? Not the size. And it puts everything on an equal playing field. Um, don't incentivize big trees. This is another city that sent me their ordinances. They wanted to look at, does this look good to me? And it's like, we'll give you double bonus credits for mitigation for development if you start with a tree that is six to eight inches in caliper when you plant it. If you specify something that's six to eight inches, you're gonna get probably a magnolia or probably a live oak, right? Because those are the things that are being produced. I'm, I'm running out of time. Oh, I'm done. Last one. Um, go smaller trees. Um, and then we're holding a conference on this. If you want to hear the rest of the talk, you can come see me in August. We're doing a conference on urban tree diversity. So thanks, everyone.